Hello and welcome. I'm kicking off my first Black Cat 2025 Cyberbytes episode, and I'm joined by Kafir Golan, CTO and co founder of C2. From starting in the IDF's elite cyber defense unit to building a high growth data orchestration platform, Kafir shares his journey, the challenges of disrupting a crowded market, and why AI driven security is just getting started. Let's dive in. So look, first uh, first podcast of Black Cat 2025, I welcome Kafir Golan, CTO co-founder at Setu. Yep. How are you getting on? Doing great, doing great. You know, every time coming to Vegas is fun, meeting all the people, all the customers, prospects, investors, it's a lot of fun. And you mentioned, uh, just as we were in the lifts, this is your fourth time to Vegas. So, right. Uh, but first, Black Cat. Yep. Cool. And other times, you've uh, you've enjoyed yourself as much? or. <laughs> Well, it's different, right? Every time that you come, like my first time that I came here was my honeymoon. And, you know, we were like <laughs> getting super excited from Vegas, seeing all the casinos and everything for the first time. So that's like a pretty different experience <laughs> than coming here for the first time. And then like, you know, the difference when you see the Venetian, for example, for the first time and you're like blown away from the sheer size and everything that's going on in Vegas yeah. versus when you come in here and you already seen these things and like more focused on work. Yeah. But I think that one of the really great things about these conventions, you know, like Black Hat, RSA, whatever, is that it brings together a lot of people from the industry mm -hmm. and you get to meet a lot of interesting people, a lot of prospects, a lot of partnerships in sort of a very dense format, which I find great, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and what is your kind of main goals out of getting from this week alone? So I think that the main goal is to get the word out, to meet with customers, being able to do demos and um, really show our potential customers how we can bring them more value. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, engaging with our um, existing customer base. Um, I'm based in Israel, so every time that I come to the US, it's an opportunity to meet some of our customers in person, you know, doing some lunches, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, ever since COVID, we got used to doing everything in Zoom, but there is really no alternative to doing like a face-to-face, -face. Mm -hmm. you know, meeting one of your customers, going out for a drink, for a nice lunch, seeing from there that they're happy, what you can do to make them even happier, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Absolutely. And sort of running it back a little bit. So um, tell, tell everybody how you kind of came into the industry of cyber, uh, where, where was the interest and then really what got you to, to kind of where you are today being a, a first-time founder? Sure, sure. So I'd say that, you know, even as a kid, I was always into tech and I got my first job back when I was uh, 15, I think. I started working at uh, Wix, which okay. now became, you know, this big household name, even I would say. Mm -hmm. So I started there and I was working at Wix for about like three years uh, in parallel to my high school days. And then uh, when it was time for me to join the IDF, the solution was, um, really going to a technological unit right away mm -hmm. and there there is like this course that you do in the idf that after you do this training you get to pick which unit you want to go and for me i chose matsov which is like the cyber defense unit of the idf mm -hmm. and from the moment i got there i just fell in love with the field you know the making sure that um you know in the military context you're literally making sure that people and like special ops and uh, weapons and all kinds of things, you're helping them to complete their missions and stay safe. So you see the real importance and, you know, I'm feeling like it's sort of a like cliche, but helping save lives because um, when you're working on security and security communications in the IDF, you really see the importance. So there I was at the IDF for about six years. Mm -hmm and doing mostly uh, secure networking. Mm -hmm. Like you can think like VPNs for like tactical devices and those kind of things. And then from there I left and I joined a company called RiveNets. I was one of the first engineers there and we built carrier grade routers for the biggest ISPs in the world. Wow. Um, so that was again, an amazing, amazing journey. Seeing a company from less than 10 people to over 500 when I left. Wow. And, you know, from sitting at the garage of our CEO and founder back then, Ido, to the moment that I think today over 50% of the traffic of at and in the US is flowing through the product that we built there. Wow. So also made me feel very proud. And back in 2022, I left DriveNets and decided that I want to go back and um, 
focus on entrepreneurship and open up my own thing. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially how I got into or back into the field, looking how I can utilize my capabilities and experience, a lot of it related to networking, highly reliable systems and uh, working with larger enterprises and bring those capabilities into dedicated fields in the cybersecurity, which is where Situ is focused at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And bringing us on to kind of present day in terms of that. So you're a first time founder. You mentioned yes. your, your other founder is a second time founder. Correct. How, how did that come about? How do you two guys meet? And really what gave you these ideas to set up where you are today? So a few words I'll share about Omer, my co-founder here. So Omer was also with me at the IDF and the same mm -hmm. unit called Masov. That's where we met. Um, Omer left the unit back in uh, 2013 to start his first company, CyberX, along with his partner back then, who is also um, from the same unit at the Army. Nice. And they worked on it for, I think, seven years from 2013 until they sold the company to Microsoft in Amazing. 2020. Yeah, and they really, you know, built it from the ground up from a field that didn't really exist back then for cybersecurity, for IoT. And um, led the company very successfully. Sorry, and then Omer did his time, you know, he was uh, at Microsoft, feeling the difference between, you know, running your own company and after the m &A, all the dynamics and everything is different. Great company, of course, but mm -hmm. it's not the fit for everyone, right? Like, uh, it's a very big difference. And after he finished his two years at uh, Microsoft and then uh, took another year, I call it, to enjoy the life after the exit, right? <laughs> and decided that uh, he wants to get back on the wagon and, you know, start a new venture. Mm -hmm. And that's when we reconnected and figured that, okay, this is, this is a great time for us to start working on this thing that we were both very excited about. And uh, yeah, that's essentially it. Amazing. And how much can you tell us about what it is you guys uh, are building and, and, and doing over at C2? Right. So I, I can be rather open about it. Essentially, what we're doing is we're building um, data orchestration platform for security teams. Like one of the things that we saw back when we were um, ideating and thinking if this is a problem worth solving is looking at the fact that there is a crazy growth in the volume of data and the complexity of data that organizations uh, need to cope with. Mm -hmm. And especially nowadays with Gen AI, it's like every new day there is another business application, <laughs> there is another thing that someone in the organization is doing, yeah. and all of those things generate data. Yeah. And it's up to the security teams to actually understand, well, what do we do with this data? Starting with how do you collect all of it in a reliable manner, when you get it, how you query it, what you're doing with it, and how you extract value out of it. And what we saw is that this is a very big problem. And as organizations mature and go bigger into their security stack and posture, it's getting even harder and harder. And we thought that this is a great place for disruption in two main ways. One is that the big problem is the category is once you get the data, how do you know what to do with it, if it's important to you or not? And we think that Gen AI and LLM specifically provide huge breakthroughs here in terms of helping people understand how they can utilize their data, mm -hmm. what's important for them and what's not, which is something that was simply not available mm -hmm. before, you know, the introductions of the LLM, chat GPT and, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we wanted is we wanted to make sure that we have a robust platform that's scalable uh, enough such that organizations can scale with it to the future, seeing the amount of data that's going to increase and that pre-existing and other solutions in the market are simply not built to handle that scale. Mm -hmm. I think that previously it would take only huge organizations to seeing you know, tens of terabytes of data collected by the security team a day. And now we are seeing this increasingly with more and more of the customers and prospects that we're speaking with that A, they are seeing those large volumes, B, they're seeing and expecting large growth of data of what's gonna come there and that they want to future-proof it, right? They want an infrastructure that can stay with them for the five, 10 years to come, not being able to change it as they will scale out their solutions. Mm -hmm. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you mentioned that 
obviously it's such a big talking point, Gen AI, LLMs and, and stuff like that. When you first come up with the idea a, a good few years ago and then maybe to where you are today, how much has it already evolved in terms of, of AI and how much of your focus has now had to switch during the time of, of working on the business? So it's amazing. I think that when we started, there was sort of like this um, feeling that you can just throw stuff <laughs> at the LLM and it will just give you correct answers and it will work. Yeah. And when you start putting it in front of users and you understand that, well, you don't just need to show the response to the user because then sometimes, you know, Gen AI may make a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. It may give you something that you don't want. And you needed to have it like explainable, like the user need to understand the recommendations they are getting. Like if we're mm -hmm. telling them, hey, you don't need this data set, or you can change this, then why, right? Like, what is this thing? Help me understand what's going on. So that's one thing that we really worked out in terms of like how we are making sure that the users understand what it is that we are suggesting to them with Gen AI. And the second thing was also the ability that um, you need to break it down into chunks that users can really work with, mm -hmm. right? I think like a good example is if you go to a user and you give them, okay, so I generated this um, guide for you on what you need to do, and it's 50 pages long, right? No one can really deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. The LLM can generate it for you, but it's not really practical. Mm -hmm. So those are the lot of things that I think as the product matured, we realized that we need to fine tune and make it really more useful and beneficial for our users. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you've obviously done a lot of fine tuning and, and working on the product. Where, where's the business today in terms of heads, in terms of the actual business growth and, and where you are today in terms of what, what you can share? Right. So we're doing great today. We're above uh, about 10 customers at this point. We are mm -hmm. growing at a very good pace. Um, we're seeing a lot of traction from the market. I think that it's funny, but one of the biggest problems that we have today is that there is just so much demand from the market when we are speaking with customers and we are seeing all these requests and we are at the point that we need to prioritize and think, okay, who is the strategic partner for us and what's right for us? Because we are still you know, a seed stage company mm -hmm. and we need to stay focused on who we work with and which areas we focus on. So it's really going great and we really, um, you know, it's a great place to be when you have to select from what's coming at you, like, okay, so these guys I will work with this one, uh, maybe a bit later. You know? mm -hmm. Brilliant. And uh, you obviously mentioned that you're obviously based in Israel and trying to work out, uh, I'm assuming, out of America. How, how have businesses been taking to you guys coming over and trying to, like you mentioned, kind of disrupt a category in terms of uh, exploring the North American market? So for us, you know, the fact that we are sort of like a split team, like I'm based in Israel and Omer, my co-founder, is in Boston. Mm -hmm. So it, it really helps in that matter. And also that fact that Omer is a second timer. So we had a good reach for customers that worked with Omer previously and he already knew and had the trust. And we also have a great go-to-market team that helped us. We recently hired our VP of sales. Amazing. And we have a sales team that's working with us. So. You know, I'd say that it's always a challenge to open up new markets and seeing that everything is working well for you, building the relationships, you know, with the channels and everything, saying what's working for us and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, it's been a great journey and very successful one. Cool. And how has your end users differed? You obviously mentioned your, your other co-founder obviously had a business, but that was in the IoT space or OT space, so working mm -hmm. a lot on critical infrastructure. Are they still your target prospects? Or if not, who, who are your ideal customers? today so i'd say that we're mainly focusing on like more mature organizations in terms of security like if i'd go to an organization and they would tell me for instance you know there's no edr yet in place you know mm -hmm. and they're not really mature or anything then it's maybe a bit too early for us we're usually looking for teams that are in the place that they already have like a, a solid security stack in place Usually they already have like a SOC team, they have like uh, custom detections, they have a SIM in place. And now they are at the phase when they're looking to uh, future proof their deployments and also uh, getting higher ROIs from what they already have, right? Mm -hmm. So more on the mature side of organizations. I'd say that most of our prospects and customers are from the Global 2000, Fortune 500, wow. those kind of things, mm -hmm. um, especially because as I mentioned, right now we're trying to focus on organizations where this problem really hurts them and it's really big. And 
help us to tone in and what's going to bring them the highest ROI, mm -hmm. right? So we are really focusing on the larger enterprises at this point. Amazing. And if we were to sit here in three or four years' time, what, where would you want the business to be? It's an amazing question. I think that <laughs> like both myself and Omer, we're looking to build a big company. Like okay. obviously, Omer already made an exit, so you know, he's good for himself. Good I've been at uh, <laughs> DriveNet has also been a very successful, still is a very successful company. And mm -hmm. uh, we're both looking to build a big company. Mm -hmm. So in three years from now, I'd love to see, you know, like uh, our customer base growing significantly having a bigger presence in the US, uh, hopefully starting to see also, you know, like Europe and Asia and seeing uh, more expansion. And I really believe that what we bring to organizations give them a lot of value. And I'm excited to seeing that, you know, like going into a customer, doing the installation, seeing that they are happy, getting the good feedbacks on the product. So me personally, that's one of those things that get me up in the morning, you know, knowing that you're doing something that really helps your customers and get them excited. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's sort of where I would like to see the business, you know, growing, having a larger customer base, making the business, you know, at the point it's like a bigger company, right? Um, yeah, that's mostly it. Yeah, no, amazing. And, and, and really just to, to kind of wrap this up and, and really, really appreciate you obviously coming on and, and giving us a great insight. Like what, what else are you kind of looking to get out of this week? and? If, if you could kind of say something now and, and, and sort of help you in over the next few months and stuff like that, what, what's the real short-term goals for the business this week and, and moving forward to maybe the rest of this year? So I think that at this point, we're still looking and engaging with like strategic partners, you know, really mm -hmm. handpicking and selecting the customers that we want to work with mm -hmm. at this stage of the company, you know, setting exactly what are the most important things to put on our roadmap and how we want to move forward. And I think that for this week specifically, I would really love and to tone in on some specific accounts that we're meeting, you know, seeing a lot of people that we already scheduled to see at the booth and seeing that we are on track, we're good with our existing customers as well as new opportunities that are coming in, honing in on that and, you know, pushing it for a good end of a fiscal year at the end of the next quarter. Amazing. And I think that's a, that's a great note to end it on. So I appreciate you uh, coming up here and, and bearing the heat. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Me too. Thank you for having me, man.